welcome back to episode two of the Wildly Unexplained. I am Gary. And I'm Danny. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be back, Gary. Yes, sir. I'm real excited. Um, so today we've actually got two cases for y'all. Um, I think that we're going to really kind of bring some some good uh, good quality cases, you know, in this episode. I'm actually, I'm really fired up about it. Yeah, I'm definitely, I'm glad we picked these two cases. These are pretty bizarre, and I'm, I'm excited about getting into them, man. Yeah, so to kind of keep the trend of uh, bizarre disappearances, um, our third case here is actually about a youngster named Keith Parkins. So this is a, this is a case that's actually going to go back a little bit. So this actually happened in April of 1952 in Ritter, Oregon. Okay? So... Keith is actually, he's a young, and he's, he's actually, he was two years old at the time that this happened. Uh, he was playing outside of the bar with a couple other kids. They were called inside, you know, it was about lunchtime, you know, give or take, so they were actually called inside, and Keith didn't respond. So the other kids, you know, you know, ran inside, whatever, Keith was nowhere to be found. Yeah, and going back, make sure that, that we reiterate. Keith is two years old. You know, he's he's a very small child. Yeah, I, I mean, I remember, you know, I mean, any two-year-old I've known, you know, isn't getting anywhere anywhere fast. No, definitely not. Tiny feet, two years old. You think about it. You some most kids start walking around 12 to 18 months. You know, they're they're not going very far at this age. Right. So, a very brief search ensues. You know, they they look around the barn. They look in the barn. You know, in the vicinity. You know. To no avail. Keith is nowhere to be found. Several hours later, you know, or you know, to, to kind of before we get into that notion, they actually, you know, they they alert the the authorities and everything, um, get some searchers to help out. Several hours later, so this is about four miles from the barn where he was last seen. estimate around that it was probably around 12 miles that little Keith had to cover in the time that he had right so good point to make um, Les Stroud who is actually a very popular survivalist uh, hit series survivor man um, you know th this guy is like fully equipped and trained you know to, to survive uh, in primitive conditions and everything like that so this guy is like he 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 comes out here and he and he actually reads all six of David Polite's books. 
Yeah. And got in touch with him, you know, to actually, you know, to discuss some of these disappearances and everything. Yeah, he was very intrigued, so he he wanted to to get in touch with Dave and, and try to go into more depth of, of these disappearances. He actually linked up with Dave on this case, and he was going to follow the footsteps that little Keith took that day he went missing. Yeah. Well, I mean, fir firsthand, you know, look at what Keith had to endure, you know, getting from, you know, point A, being the barn, to point B, you know, where, where he was found. I mean, yeah, insane. So yeah, it's definitely a good perspective. There's a video of it online. It's also in the documentary. It's it gives you a good sense of the topography that this two year old had to cover. And it's truly mind boggling. You know, the you had to cross two mountain ranges up and down. It was it was treacherous terrain. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, to kind of think about that, too, I mean, I've, I've seen you know, the, the, the online videos, uh, I, I've seen a little bit about it, you know, about Les trying to, you know, navigate, you know, this terrain. And it's not easy. No, he's definitely struggling. And you, you can definitely tell he's struggling. And not to mention that 20 hours from the point that Keith went missing to the point where he was found, it got dark out there, uh, considerably dark. It, it's, it's, kind of crazy to think about that you know because even as you know as, as a grown man um you know going into you know tr trying to retrace the footsteps of this of this young kid you know less actually details you know that that the thicket that he had to go through you know he could not see and like you know th this guy had a, had a camera you know had you know had a light with him and everything you know so so he was he was prepared you know, and there was a full moon the night that he tried to do this, you know, so he tried to go out there to retrace his kid's steps, you know, and, and it was just unsuitable to see. I mean, even with a full moon, the thicket was so just engulfing, you know, that, yeah. that he just, he couldn't see in front of him. Yeah, and going back to the fact that Les Stroud, you know, in the... In the outdoor world, you know, he's he's the ultimate survivalist. I, mean, I love his show on Discovery Channel. You know, this is the to put somebody in the wilderness, he would be the guy. You could traverse the, the the terrain and get to where you need. And to see less struggle going from point A to point B, it just it just makes this case even bizarre. Well, it it, it just kind of goes to the fact of you know how the hell did a two year old kid, you know, venture out basically twelve miles you know, from his location and make it, you know, in 19 to 20 hours. Yeah. I mean, th th this is just bizarre. No, to say the least, for sure. I, I, I mean, you know, well, just think about that, dude. Like, you know, two years old, you know, so obviously, you know, he, he's, he's got his legs, but, you know, he, two years old, I mean, you know, they're not very strong. Yeah, they're tiny legs, tiny feet, and if you look at the video and you can see the pictures, you know, the, the topography of this place is, is very rocky. There's a lot it's of dense. up and down. Yeah. So to see Les trying to get through the thicket and up and down, to just to picture a two-year-old, to try to get through the same thing, is just, it's unfathomable to me. I'm not really sure how, how a two-year-old would have done it, but nonetheless, you know, he did it one way or another. Right. Well, which is which is pretty incredible to me, um, you know, because living in Colorado, I mean, you know, we, we've got a lot of really good hiking here. And and I, I mean, even, you know, myself being in as, as, as decent shape that I'm in, you know, and, and actively hiking and everything. Um, there's definitely some some physicality, you know, to to traversing some of these, you know, different hikes. And, you know, we've got landscape that looks much like the video, you know, where they were. And it's not easy. No, definitely not. And I mean, looking back on it, and you know, the the people that they brought out, the search and rescue efforts, you know, for a full 20 hours after he disappeared. You know, uh, Keith's father actually was the one to find him. I believe he was about 50 yards away that he noticed something in the middle of a clearing. He goes over, and Keith actually is laying down in the snow uh, with his jacket next to him. His father yeah. picks, picks him up and he's alive. He's unconscious, but he's alive. Yeah, th there's actually uh, a newspaper clipping that we're gonna actually post on our Twitter um, so you guys can, can kind of see that. Um, but it actually does notate that, you know, that when they found Keith, you know, he was stiff from the cold, 
uh, Emmy exposure, and he was actually in critical condition. Um, so he was actually flown to a hospital when they did find him, you know, fortunately, and they were actually able to, you know, to, to fully, you know, get him better, which is amazing. Yeah, no doubt about it. At two years old and sub freezing temperatures, uh, uh, him putting his jacket to the side, you know, there's this, uh, I believe they say that during hypothermia, people will actually take layers of clothing off. So it makes you wonder, the little Keith, uh, was he suffering from hypothermia at this point? Probably. I mean, anything's possible. I mean, you know, if, if you really think about it, I mean, you know, it, it was it was freezing weather. You know, it, it was it was cold. So yeah. I mean, I, I would imagine that yeah, he had some sort of hypothermia at at, at some at any point of you know his his venture. Yeah, nonetheless, but you know, Keith was unconscious and. When he came to, he had no recollection of how he got there. Absolutely none. And David Politis actually uh, tracked him down all these years later. And he still has no idea what happened that day. Yeah, and I mean, I don't remember a heck of a lot from when I was, you know, from when I was two years old. But, um, you know, and, and he could have even maybe suppressed it, you know, as he, as he got older and, and just yeah. tried to, you know, kind of push it away into his subconscious, you know. But a traumatic experience like that, I mean, I mean, literally, like, like you ended up 12 miles away from where you were playing in yeah. the freezing cold, you know, face down, unconscious. I mean, yeah. that to me is just like, holy shit, man. Well, like, me looking at the distance and the time of day, the temperature, I personally don't think a two-year-old could have could have made that trip. Uh, in, in my mind, something happened to Keith that day that, you know, he has no idea. But I just don't see a two-year-old uh, traversing the, the terrain in that time and getting as far as he did. No, that's, that's a great point, too, because, you know, I mean, kind of going back to what I said earlier about here, you know, the hikes here in Colorado. I mean, some of these hikes aren't easy, man. And, and, and as, a, as a 28-year-old, you know, semi-fit guy... I mean, I even have trouble, you know, kind of traversing some of these hikes and everything. So to, to think of a two-year-old, not to mention in the freezing cold, uh, and, and kind of ironic that, th that this place is called Skull Canyon. Um, you yeah. know, we actually didn't, you know, uh, say that earlier, but this place is called Skull Canyon, so that, that's just kind of creepy. Yeah, creepy it's name. Kind, of, kind of bizarre name, but by all means but but in any sense i mean like even even for me like like some of these hikes are, are tough so a two-year-old in freezing fucking weather getting 12 yeah. miles out in 19 hours you know just shy of 20 hours that's yeah impressive. i don't buy it, that, I don't well, buy it. if it's true that's impressive yeah no kidding but i mean there's a lot of theories out there about what happened to keith that day and you know i've seen some about uh maybe he was picked up by an animal animal I don't see it. His clothes had no no rips in them. You know, he had no no exterior injuries that suggest that. Uh, other people say, you know, well, was he kidnapped? You know, it's possible, but to have somebody uh, pick up little Keith and and walk him, the, or basically carry him the distance that he did, and just leave him out there in the in the cold that far away, like, uh, what was he trying? What was this person trying to do with Keith? You know, like, what, what was the goal here? Because there was no indication of any foul play towards Keith, besides the fact that he was probably in the stages of hypothermia. No, and I do want to touch back on, you know, the, on the theories behind this case and, you know, was he picked up? Was he abducted? You know, what was there uh, animal predation that, that might have happened to happen? Um, you know, what, 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 what went down? I, and I just I just want to say, too, that there were no prints or anything like that found at the barn, you know, so where he originally started, like he literally just vanished. Yeah, his trail, his, they managed to track some footsteps, uh, some four miles away. And then at that point, the, the trail went cold. So what but, happened? But that, that was four miles out. Like how the yeah. hell do you, do you, are you at one place? And then you, you, you there, there's some tracks four miles away. I don't know. Did, you know, was he picked up? Did he That's step crazy. through a portal? I don't know. It's it's a bizarre <laughs> case, to say the least. It's, it's... Can this kid fucking teleport? I mean, if, and if he can, can he teach me? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I don't know. But, uh, I mean, you look at the facts of the case. You look at where he disappeared and where he was ultimately found. It just looked like he stepped somewhere and then he reappeared 12 miles away. Insane, man. Um, 
absolutely insane. And, you know, thank goodness he was found, you know, but again, you know, Dave Polite, like I said earlier, you know, I actually did interview him and, and he has no recollection of that day. Um, no. Which is which is insane. Uh, again, you know, a traumatic experience like that. You know, find him unconscious with it, with his jacket and his hat. You know, sitting beside him. Um, you know, face down yeah. in the snow. Yeah, and those that's, cases that's where where these people disappear and they're found again. You know, the, these cases. Uh, you know, they're out there. Uh, we try to be careful with the cases that we pick, but we definitely thought this one. out he was in, in good physical form and he was an avid hunter yeah so he actually uh hailed from brooklyn um but had actually lived in santa fe since about 1991 so again you know he knew the area very well you know hunted those areas i mean you know very you know very consistently you know so he, yes. he had a good background of where to go you know what time to go you know, and so on and so forth. So the guy knew yeah. the area very well. Yeah, so this area wasn't alien to him by any means. He knew how to get in and out of the hunting site. You know, that that was never an issue from the beginning. Right. So, normal day for him, you know, going out with, with two of his buddies. You know, they're going to go hunt uh, near Elk Mountain, actually. So th this is actually uh, right outside of Pecos, you know, uh, in New Mexico. So the day of the hunt, you know, he drives his Cherokee uh, up to the campsite and walks to base camp. So parks his vehicle next to his friend's vehicles, which is a very key point to make. Yes. At about 4.30 p.m., like this happens kind of in the afternoon, uh, his two friends decide to go elk hunting. So Mel actually had hurt his knee prior, uh, decided that he was going to build a blind, uh, near the camp. Yeah, and I believe he uh, that injury happened a couple of days before he went hunting. He actually stepped uh, inside his foot inside a gopher hole, twisted his knee. So ultimately, that led to the decision of him staying near camp while his two buddies went out to go look for some elk. Right, which makes which makes total logical sense. I mean, if I if I hurt my knee, um, I'm not gonna want to walk a far distance, you know. Right. So at that point of the game, he builds this blind, you know, and for our uh, non-hunter listeners, a blind is actually basically like a tent, 
Uh, you, you set it up and you're actually able to sit inside of it with a, basically a window. And the, the animals are, are supposed to not be able to see you, but you can see outside and see these animals. Um, so and if one passes by... Uh, right. It's important to mention that uh, this uh, this blind that he built was about 100, 150 yards from base camp. So he could actually see base camp from the point where he actually set up his blind. Uh, yeah, we're talking about a football field, maybe a little more, you know, football field than a half, you know, away. Just to kind of put it into perspective for you guys. Um, exactly. So not a very far distance, you know, by any means. You know, and, and again... He did have a hurt leg, you know, so he's not going to be walking, you know, very much or very far at this point. So at about 7 p.m., so about two and a half hours later, uh, the two other hunters return, and Mel is nowhere to be found, either around the campsite, you know, at the campsite, just nowhere to be found. Like, they, they do not see him at all. Yeah. Yeah. And it's important to mention that his jeep was still there and to the point where he was hunting it was already dark it's it's unusual that mel wasn't already back because uh, at this point there was no hunting to be done it was dark out he wasn't very far from camp so he should have been back by the time his buddies came back to camp yeah and it, it's it's kind of equally as strange uh you know like again that there was zero uh presence you know, of, of Mel. That there was nothing that he left behind, nothing to that sort of nature. Uh, so, these two hunters, you know, they're like, alright, like, maybe he wandered off, maybe he followed an elk, you know, something to that kind of nature, you know, where he was, uh, where he wandered off, you know, he'd be back shortly, like, like no yeah. big deal. Exactly, maybe he twisted his knee, you know, he, he further injured his knee, or he, he got a kill and he was working on bringing it back. Maybe he got lost, it was dark at this point. I don't know, but it's, they've definitely, it's unusual he wasn't back at this point, but they decided, you know, they needed to start looking for Mel. Yeah, so at this point of the game, they actually brought an air horn, uh, which, awesome idea. I mean, you know, in case you get hurt, you have to alert somebody. Um, you know, maybe get reunited with somebody who, who potentially got lost, just like this situation. You know, yeah. so so they actually blast this air horn, and then furthermore, they actually discharge their weapons. So they they fired their weapons into the air, uh, to hopefully let Mel hear that and yeah. you know, and and walk in their general direction, or you know, just even know that they're out there looking for him. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, if if. The they discharged their weapons, they they blew the air horn, that's, that's enough noise. If Mel actually potentially did get lost, which is unlikely, but if he did, it would have been enough for him to pinpoint where, uh, where camp was, to where he could make his way back to his friends. Right. And so after some reasonable time there, you know, blowing the air horn, um, you know, firing a couple shots into the air, they actually did alert authorities at this point. Yeah. So my first... Uh, thought, you know, in, in this whole kind of, in this whole report was that, you know, maybe you know, being in you know, Elk Mountain and everything maybe he, maybe he did wander off, you know, maybe he did uh, maybe fall off, you know, maybe there, there was a cliff face or something like that that, you know, maybe he uh, didn't anticipate or, you know, something to that kind of nature but yeah. I, I, at this point, I'd like to bring up, you know, one of the websites that we actually did find um, that actually has a lot of pictures and everything like that to kind of showcase uh, the surroundings and the environment, you know, where Mel was actually hunting. Yeah, and I believe this is a local news source that took pictures of the area that Mel was actually last seen, the base camp, and the, the surrounding trails. You know, this is a very open area. The trails are well marked. So for somebody to get lost out here, it's pretty difficult. And when you look at it, you know, you can see long distances. Like I said, it's an open area. So for him to fall off or get lost, it's, it's, it's unlikely at this point. Right, and and even just kind of going by some of these pictures, I mean, I don't even really see any cliffs to fall off of. Um, I mean, there, there's a couple questionable spots, but they're literally on a road, um, you know, with a guardrail, you know, things like that. So he'd have to actually physically leave camp, you know, to unfortunately fall off, you know, one of these, you know, crevices, you know, if you will. Yeah. But anyway, uh, this website is actually called the Santa Fe Ghosts and History Tours. Um, so this actually showcases this entire uh, 
investigation that happened with Mel Nadell. Um, you know, and, and like I said, kind of showcases some photos and also some videos um, from local news outlets, you know, looking into uh, the reports of, of this missing hunter. Um, and again, I mean, like you said, Danny, I mean, like some of these trails are just are very well marked. I mean, you know, they're very distinguishable. You know, even somebody like myself who's not familiar with the area, if I'm seeing, you know, trails like this, I mean, the, unless I completely veer off and, and just go off in a different direction, I mean, it's going to be very difficult, you know, to get lost. Yeah, and I believe this this is a, a pretty popular area. If you look at the pictures in the surrounding area, you can see picnic tables. So it's it's pretty popular. It's easy to get around. So like going back to the fact that Mel actually getting lost out here is to me is pretty unlikely. Well, right, and, and not to mention the fact that I mean most of the pictures that that are that are encased in this uh, on this website, you know. The spots that they've taken are very open. Like it, it's it's not like it's like this like lush Amazon forest, you know that that's just a it's a dense thicket, you know where where he can literally you know he he's got to crawl through, you know this yeah. this is all open land. I mean like yeah, exactly you know like the the trees are are pretty well spaced out. I mean like it it seems you know for a hunter I mean it seems like a pretty 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 good place to go you know to set up a blind. And obviously go after some elk. Yeah, it's definitely, from what I hear, the information I've gathered, it's a great spot to hunt. And, you know, it's it's open. There are areas for cover. And, you know, Mel picked a really good area near camp. Yeah, he was he was ready for whatever was out there, you know. Then the question beckons, did he see some deer? Did, did he follow them? Did he try to shoot, uh, try to get one with his definitely prepared and uh, I mean we, we can't overstate that enough that the fact that he had the full gear he had a bow he had a, a 44 revolver at his side that's a that's a pretty sizable handgun you know that, that that's enough to protect you and you know he had a knife and going into his gear you know he had full thermals uh, he was definitely prepared sure yeah it, it's to me it's it's kind of crazy um, and you know the other two hunters I mean didn't hear discharge you know uh, there were no, you know, casings found or even arrows, you know, for that matter. So obviously, you know, he didn't discharge either weapon. And if he discharged his bow, like fired his bow, you know, they didn't find the arrow. 
Exactly. And even when you go, when you look and consider the fact that the search and rescue teams that they brought out here, it was hundreds of officials. You know, I believe in the Santa Fe area, this is one of the biggest search and rescue undertakings that the state had ever seen. Yeah, right. So, you know, during the search, like they actually enlisted the help of airplanes, helicopters, you know, all terrain vehicles, you know, people on horses, tracker dogs. I mean, they, they literally, I mean, rallied everyone, you know, to yeah. try and find this guy. And yeah, it, to, to no avail. Like this area. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and honestly speaking, too, uh, they actually did come up to or come across uh, tracks, you know, that actually led from, you know, the outside into the woods. Um, the tracks led about 150 yards away from camp, and they followed a trail, which I thought was pretty interesting. Yeah, so the, from this blind, I believe they, the dogs picked up a scent from this vehicle to the blind and then follow uh, footsteps about 150 yards away from camp. And they could see foot, footprints leading into this trail, but uh, shockingly enough, uh, once they get to this trail, the footprints completely stop. So there was no, the once again, like the scent was, was lost there. The footprints stopped right there. It's almost as if uh, Melvin just vanished. Yeah, and which is super bizarre because you know they actually said that uh this guy wandered off or, you know, became delusional or something like that. And, you know, and went into hiding, you know, or something yeah. to that kind of nature. Not to mention the fact that the dogs, you know, they followed the scent to a certain area. Dogs are very good at, at following a scent. You know, it's, it just bothers me that his trail kind of went cold at that certain point. And there's nothing to indicate that anything happened to Mel at this point. It just looked like he just disappeared from the face of the earth. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's completely crazy. And, you know, to, to me, like, you know, kind of reading up on this case and everything like that, like, my first, you know, instinct and my first thought was like, oh, yeah, okay. Like, like this guy probably ran into some trouble, like, you know, maybe, you know, uh, came across an animal that, you know, he that he just necessarily wasn't prepared for. But then I got thinking back to it. You know, back to our previous point about this guy, like, you know, hunting this place for years. Like, we're not just talking about, hey, let's go to a new place. Like, you know, let's try it out. Like, this guy knew the area. Like, he knew what kind of animals were there. Yeah. 
Absolutely, and like it just it didn't make a whole lot of sense. Like if anything unpredictable would have happened, uh, you know, we would have seen signs of it. But that's just not the case. And you know, I've seen some theories about Mel and Adele about well, possibly he he traced his footsteps backwards and he hitchhiked out of town and maybe he wanted out of his life but you know experts looked into his accounts you know no, none of his accounts were touched there were no signs that that he was unhappy at home so that ultimately was dismissed so we're left to to wonder you know what happened at this point was he kidnapped was there foul play but the problem is that there's nothing to indicate that anything like that happened yeah i mean you know to kind of touch on that you know again his his financial accounts none of none of it was was touched at all i mean and reportedly you know he had a great home life i mean he he loved his family you know he was he was a true family man yeah. um you know so honestly speaking unless there was something fishy about that i mean you know they, they really did you know kind of you know discredit that that theory yeah and like i said like the rescue teams you know they, they brought everything airplanes atvs helicopters dogs it was a massive search effort and interestingly enough september 9 uh a few days after mel was missing it was like uh, a couple days after the, the search started this uh, massive storm ripped through the pecos area and they actually had to call off the the search and that might not seem like significant at this point, but the deeper we go into these uh, missing person cases, you'll see that a lot of the points that link up is uh, during these disappearances, either during or after, during the search and rescue efforts, these uh, atmospheric events are taking place that, that they kind of interfere with the search and rescue efforts or with the person actually in the process of getting lost. So that's something that we'll, we'll touch up on the future, but you know, unfortunately this massive storm came in and they had to call off the search that entire day, which makes you wonder, you know, at this point, where was Mel? Was there a chance to, to recover him at this point? And sadly the call, the search had to be called off. I don't know. Very bizarre, man. I mean, you know, and, and there are a lot of you know, speculation, you know, behind that, but you know, just kind of diving back into Mel's case, um, you know, even just me thinking about this now, like, you know, let's say that this guy was like, on the, you know, because everything always looks great from the outside. You know, if, if people want you to speculate that they've got a great life, they're going to do that. And you're exactly. not going to, you're not going to know what happens behind closed doors. So let's, let's even just take this a little you know, step further and say that this guy was completely miserable at home. You know, and he just wanted to, you know, basically go out there and be like, all right, I'm done with this. You know, I'm, 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 I'm through with this shit. Yeah. So he literally would have to be so careful, you know, to backtrack his, his footprints, you know, and, and people have speculated that, you know, that he has done this. But again, I want to point out that none of his financial accounts were, were, were touched they were not you know baffled with no money was missing no money was moved mm -hmm. so my only theory behind this is like you know or, or, or i guess trying to play devil's advocate here you know it's not uncommon for you know for for folks to have separate accounts you know so what if he had a separate financial account you know that that he socked money away into and was like all right well fuck it i'm out yeah which there were no indications to, to suggest that, but you know, like you said, playing devil's advocate, what if he did? My only problem with that is, is the fact that, you know, how, how he was perfectly able to retrace his steps, the fact that dogs weren't able to track, because if he retraced his steps, I, I'm, I would uh, believe that the dogs would have uh, followed his, uh, his trail down to where he hitchhiked, down to where he walked away to. See, and that, just... that's, that's, where the, that's where that theory kind of derails. Um... So, yeah. I mean, even even if he even if he did, you know, let's say he was perfectly aligned, you know, with his footprints, and and he, you know, backtracked his way out of out of the woods and and all that, the dogs would pick up a scent. Plus, I, I would imagine that they would be able to find, you know, some sort of of track left behind from some from a whatever vehicle, you know, would have had to pick him up at that point, because the guy is not going to be walking back to town. Let's let's be honest here, you know, bum knee. You know, literally, it was only going 150 yards into the, you know, into the woods from base camp because of that knee. He's not going to be walking. No, that, that's definitely that's another good point to to look at the fact that he had a bum knee. You know, he he wasn't going very far. I think that's the whole point we're trying to make here that 
That male went out there, he wanted to go hunting, he did not want to walk very far to do it. That's why he set up his blind where he did, and you know, he, he wasn't going to make a big deal out of trying to chase down any deer that day. Right, and I mean, you know, even even if he did, you know, decide to, you know, see an elk and decide to stalk it for a little bit in the woods, um, you know, he's not going to go far. I mean, I know, you know, if, if I've ever hurt my knee, and I, you know, I've, I've had friends who have, you know, who have really, you know, tore up their knees and everything, and they don't get very far, you know, or very fast for that, for that nature. Um, that, you know, it, it's, it's just not something that, that is plausible. No, um, I just, I don't know what to think. Like, uh, I mean, looking at Mel's case and, you know, I, I'm really intrigued by these hunter cases because how we said, we reiterated last time we, we did one of these episodes, you know, hunters, they go out here fully equipped and, you know, they, they're, they are out there to kill and they are fully prepared to do so and it's kind of scary to think that you know maybe the hunter is becoming the hunted out here and guys with uh, uh sadly uh uh hunters who hunt with uh, bows actually have go missing at a higher percentage than those who hunt with guns but it's it's true yeah, no, and, and it, it, it is a very scary notion to think about. Um, you know, I mean, I've got friend, I've got a, many friends who actually hunt, and you know, especially you know, growing up where we did, Danny. Um, you know, th there's a lot of hunters back in our hometown. Yeah, you know, absolutely. so it, it's you know, it, I, I think that's why we kind of touched upon you know Tom Messick in our in our first episode there because it hit kind of close to home. Um, but again, you know, it's a kind of coat selling what you were just saying. I mean, these guys know what they're doing. Like they're they're not just some Joe Schmo who just you know on a whim decides that they're gonna go hunting. I mean it's 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 frightening, like yeah. it really is. It just makes these cases even more bizarre. And I, I'm glad we covered this this case of Mel and Adele. And I, I'd like to go in the future. This this area where actually where Mel went missing is actually called the Pecos Triangle. And there's actually a, a group of people over the years that have gone missing. And actually during the time that Mel vanished there are uh, a few more disappearances that hopefully we'll cover in the future but it's definitely an interesting area to cover and you know we can just dismiss it as as foul play or animal predation but i believe there's definitely something worth looking into this area it, there's something sinister that, that's happening out here i don't know what it is though well, I'd also like to kind of notate, you know, that, that there are speculations that, you know, maybe he ran into some trouble at the base camp, you know, um, you know.
like you were saying earlier, you know, there was a cluster, you know, of cases that actually happened, you know, in or near Pecos. Um, you know, so so what they're calling the Pecos Triangle, you know, it's supposedly supposed to be like, you know, the Bermuda Triangle with these mysterious disappearances and everything. Yeah. Um, you know, so we definitely will touch on that, you know, in, in some further episodes and, uh, you know, just kind of try to peel back, you know, some of these, some of these particular cases, but, yeah. you know, if, if, if you guys are interested and, uh, you know, have some sort of, you know, uh, thoughts or information to share with us, please do. Um, you know, we love looking into this kind of stuff and we love bringing this, you know, this information to you guys. So if, if anything comes up or if you guys, if you guys come across a case that you guys want us to, uh, further research and look into, please let us know. Yeah, definitely. You know, you, we got, I think we got a Twitter up now, Gary, uh, an Instagram, uh, definitely, uh, check out the podcast. Let us know what you think and, and what you think we should look into. We're, we're definitely enjoying do, uh, doing this and I'm looking forward to doing this in the future, going into more cases, going in deeper. And I'm really excited about looking into these clusters in North America, especially Yosemite, but we'll see what yeah. happens hundred percent, man. And honestly, th this is happening more often than people think, you know, which, which is very, you know, interesting to me, um, you know, as far as these clusters are concerned. So, uh, next episode, we're going to detail, uh, in a little bit more depth about these clusters and, you know, kind of what, uh, Dave Polites has kind of pulled together, you know, in his research, you know, since 2009. Um, so we're going to kind of peel that back a little bit. And, uh, you know, kind of, like I said, a little bit of a deep, more deeper dive, you know, to kind of see what is happening, you know, because there's a lot of theories and there's a lot of, you know, thoughts behind, you know, what is actually happening to some of these hunters. Um, and the locations are, are just, it, it's, it's very creepy, you know, how much of a pattern, you know, some of these clusters have. I think as we go into it and get into more detail, you'll see how how mysterious, bizarre, and ominous these, these clusters are. And I think it's going to be for a good episode, Gary. 100%, man. Well, I'm excited. Uh, until next time, guys, this is the Wildly Unexplained. I'm Gary. And I'm Danny. It was a, it was a pleasure, brother. It was fun. Let's do it again. Absolutely, man. Until next time. Catch you guys later. Thank you.